So welcome to another episode of the podcast. And uh, my guest today is Mark Jolliker, who is a uh, uh, worship and creative arts pastor at Moncton Wesleyan Church. And uh, so welcome, Mark. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. And so why don't we start out just giving a uh, Give us your give us your bio. Give us a little bit of your history, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit about worship and and the arts and theology. Well, as a, an Australian youth worker that I used to uh, be shepherded under would say, I was born as a at a very young age, and I grew up as a child. Um, <laughs> I am actually I'm not from Moncton, but I I've lived in Moncton since I was about six years old, and so I did when my parents came to faith um, at an Amway convention. If wow. anybody knows what Amway is. Oh, yeah. God can use love... anything, right? Oh, my goodness. The redemption, <laughs> the redemption of multi-level marketing. Um, and we'll end that sentence. OK, we'll move on. So then uh, they ended up kind of finding faith, um, a faith that seemed to work for the most at Moncton Wesleyan Church. And so they started plugging in there when I was about seven years old. And uh, that's where I grew up and I found faith myself. So I spent a lot of my formative years there at the church. And I remember praying a prayer. Um, to invite Christ into my heart when I was at the Moncton Coliseum. And I think Pat Boone would have been the wow. uh, guest singer at the Easter extravaganza, they called it, in 1989. That's far more detail than you need, but <laughs> it's an interesting little anecdote. And so I grew up at that church. Um, and when I was uh, about, I, sorry, you asked about ministry in particular. So I guess I'll say that I also, I mean, I'm pretty Wesleyan through and through in some respects. I went to what was called Exalt 94, which was a youth convention in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was at that one. Oh, yeah? I remember that, yeah. And I don't remember who gave the cattle call to ministry, but I do remember being one of the cattle who walked down front. And so <laughs> from that point in my life forward, I operated as though I was called to full-time ministry. And I, I, I did feel that for sure. Um, however, very early on, I, even though I felt that call, I did not, when I, when I watched what many of my peers were doing in terms of like um, going to Bible college and kind of getting ready for the pastorate. For some reason, none of that clicked for me. Like it didn't feel like I don't, for some reason, this doesn't seem like where I need to go. Um, and so I discovered music at a, around the same time I started kind of playing in bands. And so when I graduated high school and one of my, many of my friends were heading off towards higher education, I was heading off towards being in vans and smelly hotel rooms for the better part of a decade, kind of traveling around and doing different. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I don't know when we, when we first met, but I do, uh, like I do have, I do have pretty tangible memories of you when you were with present reality back in the day, which would have been like the, probably in the nineties sometime. 90s. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and yeah. I know you've been in, you were in several, several bands. So several bands. Yes. Yeah. Many of, uh, many of whom made, uh, tens of dollars, tens and tens of dollars. <laughs> uh, so I did a lot of that. And um, I did have one band that did uh, well enough that we we did some, you know, uh, some pretty significant travel. We had a uh, one album that was, you could call it a, a label release if you want to, but it was an independent label, but it was a very high quality recording. And so uh, we did, did a lot of traveling and um, kind of all the while I felt like, well, this is kind of like, this is doing ministry. Like I, I am connecting with people. Um, retrospectively, I know that I was never, this is something I had to kind of come to terms with later in my life. I never took enough advantage of the people aspect of that ministry. I was very focused on the production of like the art and making the music or whatever. And that and would I mean, be, that would be like stereotypical of, of bands, right? Like it's, I think so. it's kind of like the exceptional band that that invests in the relational people part. Uh, yeah, and you and, would, what would kind of shame you into it is when you would tour with one of the bands who did that well, and then you'd be like, oh, wow. Right. Like there's, they're, not just are they at the merch table, like really interacting with people like well into the evening, but like they're spending time with the sound guy. Like they're spending time with the venue people. Like that you can, you can see, it's like they're treating this as a ministry and so. Well, and there's a temptation for anybody who does like a platform kind of ministry, like there is a great temptation to like, that is your ministry yes. to, to just kind of end there. And, uh, and like, it's, you, you have, you have what you do on the stage and then uh, it kind of goes on and off like a, like a switch. 
you would see guest speakers perhaps mike who could you could think of the same kind of uh same kind we don't need to name names but you can see kind of like those <laughs> high level platform speakers who roll into town and uh they could have a you could see the the good and you could see the maybe the not the bad but the squandering of the opportunities so the, the wasted wasted opportunities yeah and those uh and the people who did that they they were kind of like shooting stars they never you know like if you looked over the long term mm -hmm. they didn't uh their their ministry didn't last because they didn't quite get the bigger picture of of uh of you know that you're just kind of on all the time that it's not a it's not something you turn on and off but i have uh I have observed that on on several occasions. I'm sure you have too. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Um, so after I, my wife and I, we, we we lived in Tennessee for a couple of years, and when we moved back from Tennessee because we wanted to have a child and realized that it would be fiscally irresponsible uh, for us to have a child while we were living in the states at that point in time, we came back up to Canada to start our family. And um, at that point in time, I was like, I mean, I had worked a lot of jobs. I mean. I, Forrest Gump is kind of a dated reference at this point in time, but uh, for a long time, I would say like, I have kind of lived the career lives of, of a Forrest Gump where I've just like, right. I did a lot of jobs and they were very short term uh, and in a lot of different cities uh, just to be able to kind of get by. So were you, um, were you doing the Nashville thing? Were you around Nashville when you're in Tennessee? Yes, we yeah, lived in yeah. Nashville for yeah. about two years or so. Um, and so I did, I did some studio work. The, we, we moved down as a band, the band quickly dissolved we did some recording and stuff like that but the band didn't quite make it um, but right, each of right. us it was a part of our story that each of us sort of like learned from that and did different things based on our time there so um my wife was a, my wife is a teacher and so she was able to teach down there which was helpful but if she was going to go on maternity leave we were going to starve so right. <laughs> uh, coming to coming to canada was uh, was going to be the move so when i came back up here i realized it was like it's time to get like an actual job and so i got a job and um had that job turned into kind of a micro career for about three years or so to the point where I like music which was like my uh, not just my bread and butter but like my identity music was who like mark equals music that was me and then it got to a point where I was like playing on the worship team like once a month at my local church and like that was it like it had be it had become such a remote part of my identity and I actually came to a point where I realized that through a strange kind of um, series of attritions, I was like, I'm okay with that. Like, I'm, I'm comfortable, I'm confident in who I am. God has me in a place. I'm able to, to uh, minister to my family, yes, but also minister to the people that I work with. I'm good. And then like a month after that, uh, I got essentially called into being the worship pastor <laughs> at, at the local, uh, local church where I currently serve. And uh, it was a it was a pretty quick turnaround process within about a month or so I had been hired um, and it was nothing that was on my radar at all. I'd done a lot of worship music in the past, but the majority of my career had been in performance music and in writing and stuff. Uh, and I'd never been a pastor in any capacity. Uh, and so to move from that to being what you mentioned at the beginning of this is like the, the title was before I got there and remains to this day, a pastor of worship and creative arts. And so I've been there for six years now. Uh, fulfilling that role and it has been a, a wonderful uh, roller coaster ride and a lot of growing and and, uh, and stretching and whatnot but I'm really happy to be where I am yeah and uh, it's it always it always amazes me looking back how like God re never really wastes anything and so a lot of uh, you know because Moncton is a larger church and because you uh, you're kind of like, I don't mean this in a, I don't mean this in a negative way, but like in a larger church, you're more like putting on a production. Sure. Like the last time I spoke at Moncton, it was kind of like, you know, arrive early, get wired up. Uh, uh, like here's the, here's the X on the stage. Here's the box that you can move within because we're filming. And it was, it's much, it's just much more, has much more production values than, uh, than if you're just going to a church of a hundred or whatever. And mm -hmm. so, uh, but but like you you know you are the perfect person because you are you are have training in production right and you 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 can bring that that love that professional level that's that's needed to uh, to the local church so uh, so that's what kind of that's attention to manage though so come, yeah, we, come, yeah we can come back to that if you haven't right, already right, <laughs> right. Yeah. oh for sure yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
<laughs> and you uh, did you add some like theological education on then at that point or how? Well, like... yes, actually. So glad that you mentioned that. Yeah. I... <laughs> well, I know that. Uh, I know that you 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 not only love talking about worship, like you love talking theology too. You have a real interest in, you know, digging into the scripture. Yeah. So um, I took, I th maybe similar to you actually. I'm not sure now that you mentioned that. I, I can't remember, but um, I took like zero post secondary until I I had a, I actually had applied at a couple of universities and I got um, accepted. One of them was in Chicago, or just outside Chicago at Greenville College. Um, which is actually where Jars of Clay, uh, the band, the, right. uh, used to be a huge deal, where they formed and, and recorded their first album. And so at that point in time, they had like a program that was like all for how to be essentially a contemporary Christian musician. And so you're deep enough in the in the weeds that you might remember a band called Small Town Prophets as well. Oh, yeah. I like uh, them. <laughs> they, were also, they were also from there. Uh, right. They were sort of the second generation of this kind of output. And I was like, I was very interested. And so I went there and I applied for it. And and I went through the process and I saw what the bill was going to be. And I was like, but I'm already doing this. Do right. I want to you know, get this huge uh, student loan so that I can maybe also do it? And I was like, anyway. So uh, post-secondary was a, a thing of the past for me for a long time uh, until I actually was in Tennessee. Uh, and I decided that I'd been doing some writing at that point in time for a few magazines and newspapers. And um, I had been put on to this distance education um, course, actually through the University of London. And so I took uh, I took an English degree from the people who invented English, is basically. Right. And so I uh, that was my undergrad was English, um, and it was uh, very interesting. I like I like to correct people's grammar now. It's very fun. Um, <laughs> and I appreciate when you correct my grammar. <laughs> so. <laughs> So that being said, that was all. That was all I had taken. I'd taken zero. I read the King James Bible, for example, for my undergrad because it happens to be a uh, landmark work of English right. in their in their in their consideration literature, right? Not holy writ. So I had no formal education whatsoever. When I got this job, um, there was actually no expectations on me at that time that I needed to have any kind of formal um, theological underpinnings. Um, the, I needed to have a good theology, but there was no like you need to be on the ordination track. That was never put upon me. Right. However, very early on, through a few people who I had the pleasure the, the pleasure of working alongside for only one year, uh, somebody who was on this podcast recently, uh, Doctor Reverend Michael Tapper, and through through his kind of encouragement and a few other people, they were kind of like, you might find that if you get a little bit more foundation, you might you might thrive. You might be able to do the things that are kind of like on the top level a little bit better. And so I started taking a few of the flame courses, which is just kind of like correspondence courses through the, through the denomination. And what I found was, um, I'd never loved school. Like I wasn't just like, Oh my gosh, I can't wait for school. I mean, that was never me neither in grade one nor in grade 12, but, but that was because I didn't understand how, how I would ever use algebra. Like I was like, I'm never, I'm, like quadratic equations are not something that is gonna make any impact in my day-to-day -day life. And a little did I know that I actually would need to use math when I grew up. But what I found right away when I started taking these courses was I was learning something on a Monday night, like at 7 p.m., writing about it on Wednesday afternoon. And then I was using it on Sunday morning. It was like immediate input to output. And so right. I was like, man, like I'm, loving this coming like the return on investment was like completely noticeable and trackable so i was like i want to keep doing this and so i did flame courses for a few years and you know i think it's like 22 or 23 credits that you need for ordination i wasn't necessarily going for ordination i definitely i got my six pack done within the year so that i could be a licensed minister um but i was like i kind of I, I see no reason to, to stop i'm enjoying these courses things that people would be like you you enjoyed the doctrine of holiness class yes i enjoyed <laughs> the doctrine of holiness class so as i'm going through this though after a few years i'm getting a good amount of feedback on um the kind of output that i'm giving in terms of like my written reports and whatnot and i'm considering like do, might i want a further uh might i want to pursue more formal education and that's something that would be interesting to talk about possibly but not necessarily with me we talked about formal education a right bit on this podcast but there's a there's a push and pull i think within our denomination uh, within our within our um, ecclesial tribe if you will whether there's value in 
more formal education. But leaving that aside, I was kind of like wrestling with whether I wanted to or not. Uh, but I was like, if I did, all of these flame credits, as useful as they are for me, are useless to the broader world. Like I, if I took all 23 of these courses and knocked them out of the park in terms of like what, it, then I would show them to a university and they would say, these are not yeah. courses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, right? So I was like, what do we, uh, so uh, I was like, well, I wonder if I could take a master's and so enter Kingswood University, the Master of Arts in Pastoral Theology. And uh, I truly appreciated that experience as well. I mean, it was like, it was more, it was obviously more academically rigorous, but um, not like mind blowingly more academically rigorous, you would say, than what it was to take the flame courses. What it was, was they were actually holding you to a higher standard, right? You couldn't just kind of mail it in or whatever. Right. So, um, which I never mailed in the flame courses anyway. I emailed them in, but uh, <laughs> I did, I did the best work that I could. So what's your, like, what, what's your theology of worship then describe? Because I know you have a kind of a probably, a lot of people, when they hear the word worship, they just immediately think music, uh, and you have a broader, uh, a broader perspective than that. So give us your your, if you can give us like a, <clears throat> like the, Coles or Cliff's Notes version of your theology of worship, what would it be? Spark, spark Notes in the twenty first yeah, century. Right? Your right. Spark Notes. Actually, maybe those are dead too. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I wish I had a, an, an articulation of this. I, I don't. So that's actually one of the courses, surprisingly, uh, one of the courses that I have not taken yet is the worship one. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so I kept, I kept kind of pushing it off. I was like, ah, I probably need that. Um, because as you kind of noted, like for most of our churches, if, I, if we put together a four song set that has the right key and people can sing along to it in the songs that they like, they will consider worship to be done. <laughs> like you did a good job of worship. So, uh, so having a theology of it is, is uh, sometimes easy to skirt around and not necessarily having to. The way that I've recently had to say it to somebody is, I think, um, I think the Bible is teaching us that the worship is about communion with God. And so the goal of worship, people often kind of wrestle back and forth with whether worship is for God or whether worship is for people. And most people would say, I think when you press them, they'll say, no, I mean, obviously it's not about my preferences and my desires. It's not about whether I, that was the perfect BPM for me or whether I like the lights and smoke or whether I prefer incense and candles, but it's about God. I think that's what mo most people would say. But I think that the, the goal of like, when we say worship, we're usually meaning not just like the whole of life, but we, we gathered worship when we come together, whether that's with two people or with 2000 people, what is that about? And I think what that's about is having communion with God. It's about connecting with God. That's why God wants this is because he actually wants to be with his people. That's when he inhabits the praises of his people, as it says in Psalms, or is enthroned on the praises of his people. It's because he wants to meet with us. And so the goal yeah. of worship is about meeting with God. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I'm like a metaphor guy. I like I literally think in pictures, and so <laughs> the way I understand worship is is uh, you know the scripture you reference, where it's like when we worship, we're kind of building a throne for God to come in the midst of us and sit on, mm -hmm. you know, so we can experience His His presence. And right. so, getting back to the earlier thing of you know whether it's whether it's it's about God or it's about us, I. I think there's a lot of there there are some things that are that are either or but there's a lot of both and going on and and right. so for worship it's like is it you know obviously it's about god it's mm -hmm. like worship but uh but there are certain there are certain things that allow us to commune mm -hmm. and we kind of know what they are as individuals like there we all have different ways to connect with god and so so the worship is it's it's not so it's not just about like sometimes we write off like preference like you should just be able to worship in any way you know like and but we don't exist in a vacuum and we uh and we we all are wired differently and so i you know i think it's okay i think god understands if some people connect you know uh through certain kind of worship and then other people connect in like i think it's there's it's broad enough to, to encompass like all though it doesn't have to be an either or in terms of in, in terms sure. of worship yeah I lament um, so you um, when we were offline you referenced being at a, a church uh, in New York that is uh, if, if I remember correctly 
largely Caribbean based, right? Right, right. So I don't know what the music is like at that church. Right. But I can guess uh, that it's probably substantively different than the music that is on an average Sunday at Moncton Wesleyan Church. And so I get that. Like, I understand. Even if they do the same song. 100%. Like, yeah, it, exactly. it's just Here's totally the, different, totally I'm different vibe, right? The same sheet, the same sheet music. <laughs> right. And yet, if right. you MP3 that you'd be like, this yeah. is not the same song, right? Um, so I understand the cultural call to that. Um, I think it's practical. And I think that, like, because the Bible doesn't have sheet music, like, there are, there are no chord charts in the Psalms, right? Like, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility to be able to do that. It seems like God was okay with us being able to kind of make cultural accommodations for worship to an extent. Um, so I, I understand that. What I lament is the sort of like micro attempts at it. And so like a, a Caribbean culture is different than a Canadian culture. Yet if we're in Canada and if we're in a community, we I would, I just, I haven't fully thought this through and yet I'm going to say it for, you know, whoever will listen. <laughs> I, it saddens me to think that we have to have, or we feel like we have to have sometimes these sub congregations for our worship. And so like, if, if there's no linguistic barrier, then what else would be stopping us from being able to kind of let our preferences grow together, I guess. So oh, like for er sure. yeah. early on, like when am I, I think it was probably about five years ago there was actually talk in our congregation about like should we go back to a multi-service model like where we have at the end of the day like a contemporary service for lack of a better term and a, a classical or if you are like a more heritage type service and i was like why would you ever want to make that move back like why would you ever want to 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 start to splinter your congregation in that way. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's still the same church, but we're worshiping in different ways. And I was like, but like, but gathered worship sort of like is the only thing that makes your church, um, is it, aside from a, a church wide pop potluck, potluck or picnic, whatever, like it is the only time that your whole church gets together. And so I'm like, to me, I, it, it's worth fighting through some of these things. So this, this Sunday at our church, we did a song that, um, how it, I, should, I really should think things through before I say them through. I'm gonna, like, I would <laughs> never have picked this song. You I mean like, I, so and I'm the worship pastor at this church and, and I've been hearing people actually for a few years be like, we should do the song, we should do the song. And I was like, I don't want, I don't like that song. I don't want to do that song. But I, it, it's become clear to me that enough people in our congregation resonate with this musical style. And so I was like, well, it's not about the people. It's not about making them happy. But it is about understanding that all of us are one body. And so having a small subset of this body pick the cultural experience for this larger body, that doesn't make sense either. And so that's why we've operated for a long time on the idea that we need to have what we do call a heritage piece in the majority of our services. We do something that tips its hand back to the, to the kind of more, if not ancient, older parts of the church so that they have some sort of like I, I say we need to let people know that the church wasn't born in the year 2000 right like they need the, whether that's through a liturgical practice or whether it's through a hymn or whether it's through you know I could sing of your love forever which at this point in time is a pretty deep throwback <laughs> like something that calls people back to the past like an, an almost for lack of a better term an, a nostalgic piece of the service like that should be a non-negotiable so too now it needs to be you know I can't simply just look at what Bethel and Hillsong and Vertical are putting out for not just content, but style. I can't just look at pop music style and say that's going to be enough to aesthetically draw in this kind of a diverse congregation. I have to be looking for what their cultural kind of preferences, cultural wirings are leading them towards. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And uh, also just in terms of our culture, like we're we're in so many silos and echo chambers that you know, like church is one of the few places left where you're kind of almost forced to to be with people who are very unlike you culturally or you know in your except in your thinking it, right yeah except we make it easy for them to move as soon as they feel like they're different right we make it right. really easy for them to go oh well there's a church for you and i i understand that impulse too right like we, right. we want to be able to be to make sure well hey if you're going to leave then or if you're over here 
we want to meet you where you're at. But you, I, what you said earlier is like, that is the value of the church in some ways, not just for culture, but like one, one body, you know, it's the one, it's the right, one body right. of Christ. Right. So like, like what can we do? I, I can't imagine that in, in our lifetimes, we're going to get to a, you know, there are no denominational borders, whatever. I'm not even sure that's what anybody wants, but why would we keep wanting to splinter it more and more and more? Right. And uh, I, w- I was at uh, I was at Hillsong in uh, in Sydney, Australia, like uh, in 2019, it's kind of like pre COVID. Uh, and one of the things, you know, I, my exposure to Hillsong had always just been through the music and through Hillsong, New York, which is like hipster central. Uh, and, and and like one of the things about being at Hillsong on a Sunday morning, I was kind of like, oh, this is like a real church. Like right. there's a broad diversity of people here. Mm-hmm. There's a broad diversity of age groups, mm-hmm. uh, and they're doing music that uh, they're they're doing. They're not just doing the current music they put out there, you know. And so uh, that was kind of I, I was I was like, oh yeah, like this. Everything that's grown out of Hillsong has has grown. It actually started as a local church that takes all those things into account, yes. and and it's kind of grown, grown from there. So, uh, so any uh, any other things about worship that you think are important to to say to people? Just uh... <laughs> I didn't come with anything prepared. Sorry, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, um, so as you know, Mike and I have been part of a team that's been kind of looking at a few different things over the last few years, Mike Tapper. Uh, And so there's a, I don't know when this will air, but there's a, an article that'll be coming out in the next issue of worship leader magazine, which I'm, I think is going to be within the month. Um, It's been referenced in a few other places was referenced in Christianity today in December. And it's been getting, uh, I think West life actually speaking of the Wesleyans, I think they have an article that's coming out very soon as well, kind of about the, the project, but those are all kind of things that are referencing to the project. The project itself hasn't been published fully yet. It will be coming out in that Worship Leader magazine article. But essentially, the kind of one of the takeaways from it is it it says that the lifespans of worship songs have have shrunk relatively dramatically in the in the last little while. And so um, we do this. It's not just like what do what are you thinking about it, whatever. Like we looked at sixty two hundred lines of of entries from CCLI, uh, which is the copyright licensing um kind of wing essentially for the for the for a lot of the world really but for north america in particular and so uh even though we acknowledge that this is only a slice of the church this is not globally representative it seems to be representative globally uh, in terms of how the trends are moving in a lot of directions which is to say that songs arrive in churches a lot faster than they used to they stay in churches uh, they kind of peak really fast and then they will leave churches a lot uh, faster than they used to. So um, when you say this to people, uh, very often they're like, so, so what, right? Unless you're somebody who's lived in the worship world and then you're like, you have a bunch of questions about it. But for the average Joe, there's like, what does that mean? Uh, and I think it means they're, they're both pros and cons to this. And so one of the things that I would encourage worship leaders and or pastors and or really anybody who might be listening to think about is kind of what does worship do? So I mentioned that I, uh, that I, I think I said this beforehand, but I, I, every once in a while I will speak as well. And so I spoke a few weeks ago on the book of Job and I took, you know, 15, 20 hours um, over several weeks to kind of prepare and craft this sermon. And at the end of the day, I, I, I was actually able to, it was one of the only Sundays, it was a huge snowpocalypse. And so we were only online anyway. Um, and so I was able to watch this service at home with my wife and my children. And I can virtually guarantee that if you interviewed my wife, my partner in life for 14 years, right now, a mere two weeks later and said, what did Mark talk about on that day? She would have a hard time. And it's not because she doesn't love me or because I didn't knock it out of the park. I did a great job. I did a great job, Mike. (laughs) Um, It's that sermons in the short term, at least, are not very sticky. Like sermons, you can, if you're in pulpit ministry, and so if you're you're kind of week in and week out 
sitting under the ministry of somebody. Yes, absolutely. The Bible teaches It's more of a cumulative you. effect, though, right? Absolutely, yeah. 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 It, it will form people over time. However, of course, we're in a huge danger time, which is that people are being formed by one person who's speaking to them on Sunday, possibly, if they go one out of four Sundays, but then also being formed by whatever celebrity speaker they would like to hear form them the next Sunday. But that, that's neither here nor there at the moment. The point is, is that you don't really, really remember sermons. And if you read your Bible all the time, then you might remember your Bible. But you do remember songs. Songs have this incredible way of embedding so, Songs and stories are sticky. Songs yes. and stories. Yeah. yeah, and you'll forget the details of the stories, yeah. but you'll remember the gist of them, like the yeah. kind of the container that they came in. Um, and then, but most people, because of the way that melody and lyrics combine, they'll remember, yes, Jesus loves me the Bible tells me so, or they'll remember amazing grace, how sweet the sound, whatever, like, um, they'll remember, um, he calls me out upon the waters, you know? Um, so if you have been formed at least, you know, three or four times in a row by a certain song, especially in congregationally singing it, that content is embedded in your brain. And so in our congregation, I mean, maybe somebody's listening right now is from an Anglican church or from, uh, you know, Roman Catholic church or from a, an Orthodox Church, I don't know. But the overwhelming majority of people who are probably listening are from uh, evangelical traditions, if any faith traditions at all. And so you'll know that you don't have any rote prayers. Maybe your church does the Lord's Prayer, I'm not sure. But I would be willing to wager, if I was allowed to wager, which I'm not because I'm a Wesleyan, I would be willing <laughs> to wager that most of you don't have any kind of prayer book or anything like that. that you Maybe you're encouraged to read the Psalms. I'm saying all that to say you don't have anything week in and week out that is like verbatim, this is something that I can kind of latch on to and, and internalize, except except for the songs that you sing. And so like when, I, when, when I'm faced with a storm, like it is very natural for me to say, you know, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, you know, let this blessed assurance you know, it is well with my soul. Like those, that can come out of you as a prayer when you need it the most. It's not Bible, uh, but it's a dissemination of biblical truth. So it's somebody who's poetically taken the truth that you can count on God, no matter what comes, has put it in a poetic form, given it a melody, and then laid it in front of you week in and week out so that you can internalize that. And then that truth is written, not just on your head, because that's that would be like if you if you sat there and read it over and over again, then it would be yeah you, you could wire that in your head. But it's it's actually kind of in your feelings, like it's in your heart. Uh, and so that's what the power of worship has, especially communal worship, especially repetitive communal worship. So one of the strengths of the idea that we can turn on a dime now, I use the song "The Blessing" as a great example. You know, when we're in the height of the pandemic global anxiety is at a possibly a peak um this song kind of bursts onto the scene through elevation worship if if the lore is to be believed it was like written on a friday and then like you know recorded on a sunday and then like literally within one to two weeks is being led in churches all over the world never in our past could we have had that kind of a firm to table just like now we have a global anthem that fits. It's a, a prayer, a prayer, a, and a very scriptural prayer, frankly, that, that fits our kind of like cultural moment. Never would that have been possible before. And yet the downside, or the, the risk, you could say, is if you pulled how many churches are singing the blessing today, I don't know what we would find. What I suspect we'd find is that it's an awful lot less than we're singing it in April and May 2020. And so what are the long-term effects of, of this? Are these songs, which are great, I, I, I'm not in the camp of somebody who says like songs ain't what they used to be. Uh, I think there were a whole lot of pretty sketchy hymns <laughs> or uh, hymns that had like really kind of like nebulous theology or theology that we don't even hold to. But for some well, the, reality, you know, like, the reality of all music is that, you know, there's a ton of it produced and only the, only the best stuff lasts. Right. Yes. So, yes, so sure. often, often you're comparing the very best of the past yes. with, with all of the stuff of the present. Right. And so, right. It's, yeah. But 
we we adopt these songs. I mean, I, I can't speak to all congregations, but we do have a lot of data that suggests that a lot of congregations adopt these songs fast. And I'm not saying they're bad songs. In many respects, I think they're they're fantastic songs with with actually really appropriate theology. But there's there's also traits. there's also a lot of like, for a better term, like throwaway. It's like for sure they're they're true true words. They come from the script, but but you have the sense that this is. This is a song that we're going to sing for the next two months, and then we'll be on to the next. Right? But we don't know. But I don't. I don't know why, though. I think right, the right. only reason I can say the only there is no way to know exactly why this happens. A bunch of different theories. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a I'm a fan of the displacement theory. So right. I think it's not necessarily that people are discarding these songs after two or three months because they're quote unquote tired of them. Right. Um, but that there is new. You're not going to add. Well, you know what? We've got an awful lot of great songs coming in. I guess this Sunday we're going to sing six songs instead of five. Like right. I don't, I don't think that happens in most of our congregations. And so, when a new song comes along, if you adopt it, you have to. Right, right. There's no more water that can fit in the jar, right? Like you're right. just going to, you're going to push it out. And so, I think that's one of the, one of the reasons why uh, the glut of new music that's coming out, in, in some respects, causes us to have a more rotating songbook. And right. one of the one of the ramifications of that is if you sing a song eight times. It will be it'll it'll be lodged somewhere here and here. If you sing a song seventy five times, it will be lodged deeper somewhere here and here. And I don't mean right. seventy five times like you know in a year and a half, but over six, seven, ten years, right? Like that right. kind of constant repetition. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? Like that that Tomlin song has like it, it's it's one of these ones that has made it kind of into the the cultural milieu of a lot of churches, and so. It will be it will be in there, um, probably deeper than say some of these other ones, and so a breadth of those kinds of prayers and um, the kind of what I want to say is we should be keeping an eye on the kinds of prayers that are in our in our worship songs, and then how how often we're changing these prayers for people so that they don't necessarily get a chance for them to be internalized. That's that's a really good point, and. Uh... Like if uh, if music is kind of like the soundtrack of our lives, like if you think of your life as a movie, like the soundtrack can make all the difference in a movie. <laughs> like, and and what I've found is like with with particularly with worship, because um, I I encourage people to you know make worship the soundtrack of your life because when you get in those storms and you get in those hard times, like you need the right song to be playing in the background if yeah. you are going to respond like in the right way. Right. That's good. Yeah. yeah. But then to talk out of both sides of my mouth, I will also say that <laughs> I'll also say that this coming, um, or in two weeks from now, I don't know, it's on February 20th, uh, 19th on February 19th. Um, our church is going to be hosting, uh, an arts event and our, our, an arts night. That's about kind of all about creativity and stuff. And so part of the reason that this conversation here sparked is because you and I were having a conversation last week. Yeah. I, I want to, yeah. And I want you to like, uh, describe, imagine a little bit and what you're like, how that came about and what you're trying to accomplish with that. Maybe we'll make that the closer today. <laughs> yeah. For, yeah, yeah. Um, so imagine is, um, it's just an arts fest and so we call it imagine 22 because last year we called it imagine 21 and that was the uh, that was the first one that uh, in this iteration that came around and so actually at Moncton Wesleyan Church um, there was for a, a good solid I want to say four or five years at least there was a run in the past of something called recreate which was an arts festival which was actually run by my predecessor and very good friend Jason Muir who's currently at our sister church over in uh, the St. John area at King's Church uh, and so he he was part of a team that launched Recreate, and it was just it was just an arts fest. So it was an opportunity for a lot of people to come in and show their wares and to kind of be creative, and and it was really really well received within the church and within the community. And and when I showed up on the scene in February of 2016 or whatever it was, it was one of the things where I said, "That seems like a great idea," and I cannot handle that right now. And so it got it got tabled, um, and so. Um, it kind of kept coming up through the weeds of, over a number of years. We're like, hey, man, that Arts Fest was really awesome. We should totally do that again. And I kept saying, yeah. And I kept pushing snooze, pushing snooze, pushing snooze. And then uh, when the pandemic hit in 2020 and, and everyone had a little bit like their job descriptions kind of went right up in the air, um, when things kind of started to kind of settle into some kind of rhythm for me near the end of 2020, I looked and I thought, 
I feel like maybe now, maybe now is a perfect time to give people like a creative outlet and a creative outlet um, and using that word really intentionally when I say creative, like I had noticed that we were a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of the pastoral counsel that I gave in 2020 was you need to do something because uh, there was a whole lot of people that were just sitting there and just watching and just listening and just consuming and just taking in taking in taking in and like podcast listening went through the roof right, right. netflix netflix viewership went through the roof and and um but like doing right like actually making do, like you know being a producer uh had kind of fallen off and so one thing i was just like get up you know and do something and so part of this was just more like a, it was like a pastoral response of being like we need to be a people who are who are not just consumers but who are creators who are not just you know takers but who are givers and so uh, imagine was an idea like we need to choose creation over consumption was kind of one of the taglines uh and so uh at that point in time we were hoping that it was going to be something uh like an in-person art exhibit and so we would be able to have you know people bring their paintings and right. sculptures over to the most western church and we would create a you know be able to walk through whatever well history had other plans uh, we weren't able to gather in uh, february of 2021 as you probably as it's hard to remember when you were able to gather and when you weren't able to gather, frankly, over these last couple of years. But that was a dry spell of, of being able to gather. And so we went online only, which has its ups and downs. One of the ups that it had is that it gave us the opportunity to have a pretty wide reach. And so for that, we were able to have people who submitted work from like uh, from Halifax, and but also, you know, obviously local people. We had people who submitted from Vancouver and from, British, uh, from um, Calgary and whatnot. And so it was very wide open. It wasn't just like, I wanted this to be for Moncton Wesleyan's people. I did, but I didn't want it to be just just for Moncton Wesleyan's people. And so we made it like, hey, if you have any kind of, if you're hearing the sound of this voice, that means that in some way you're able to be connected back to our community. And so, and we also didn't make it, ch uh, we didn't make it churchy. So we made it a weekend. So the Saturday event, which was uh, turned out to be an online broadcast uh, and also kind of like a, an online curated uh, gallery so we had like a, an hour-long show but then also a gallery that had individual entries for everything that was very much like there were people who submitted that who were definitely from our church and there were there were definitely faith-based products you know like you like this is, maybe there's a christian message behind this but then we also had people who submitted who um, were in some respects even antagonistic to faith um, and i was like is the art good super uh we, we we reserved the right to say it was offensive and if it's offensive then we're going to you know it's a church and so I'm sorry, but we don't need to show. We uh, we don't need to show everything that comes in. But we also didn't make it a prerequisite that it would carry some sort of a Christian message for it to be able to be uh, accepted into the show. And so that's carried over into the, it was very it was wildly successful, and it made a lot of inroads, frankly, to some of our kind of community who were artists, especially in the Moncton area. And so for Imagine Twenty Two, we've kind of repeated the same playbook. We though it looks like we could gather at this point in time it's hard to say the uncertainty of it all made it really kind of impractical to try to put a bunch of planning into doing a physical display and uh, then have so, it all canceled the day exactly before, yeah right? it's like yeah. a lot it's a lot of work and, <laughs> and um so i i'm optimistic that for imagine 23 um we'll be able to have like more of a physical component uh, but this year we've got a, a, a ton of great submissions that have come in and we're actually the deadline was yesterday and so when i'm off this call and so what's I, what is the like what is the scope what are like when you what kind of art right yeah. well so part of the thing we're gonna be doing this year is we're also going to have a series of conversations kind of panel panel discussions um one of them is going to be a uh, uh, kind of tutorial on how to use digital art on ipad so we've got a, a friend of mine who's going to be doing that we also have a conversation about art and money. So uh, we're going to be talking about how you, should you be charging money for art? And when you do, what's what's reasonable? How do you make a living as an artist? What is an NFT? Uh, those are going to be part of a conversation we're going to have. But also we're going to be having a conversation that's like, what in the world is art? Uh, and so uh, nobody's going to find that interesting, but I will. I find that really interesting. <laughs> and the reason I mentioned it is because we're like, you know, we have kinds of submissions that, uh, so we've had people who have sent in clothes that they've made. We have people who have sent in pictures of food that they've made. We also have picture, people who have sent in, um, uh, you know, paintings and sculptures. And we have we have music videos and we have dance that's going to be a part of it. We have poetry readings uh, and we have fiction writing, uh, kind of like both both story writing and also just kind of like creative nonfiction, that kind of stuff. 
um, which you would fall in that category. And we had some wonderful paintings that were submitted by uh, by yourself as well. And so this it's an incredible range of so stuff. So pretty broad, been, pretty yeah, broad. Yeah, absolutely. Range. Yeah. yeah, and then even still, like last year, if I if I may, we had somebody who sent in something last year. I, I think I've only had to to turn down two things so far. So it, it's not me. It's a, it's a, a panel of people who we vote on. We vote on it beforehand to make sure, and we're very you know very wide in terms of like what what can make it in but there was a few things last year we looked at it and, and we had to say like this is really like this is great but it's i don't think we can call it art and so like having that kind of like <laughs> understanding of of like you know if, if we if we call it a creative a creative festival like in, in other words if it's just if it's just about cr things that you make um but we we, we try to stick a little bit with the idea that we're going to call it Art, and that forces us to have some sort of a definition of you know what art is and so that that your that conversation will be us essentially working that out in real time for anybody who was like but wait a minute why didn't mine get in there it's like well it's it's you know, listen i couldn't do it that's part of the thing that i had to say to one of the people was like no one is saying that what you did was not impressive or that any of us could have done it but that neither does that mean that like my mechanic uh can do things that I I'm right right I can't yeah. even change my tire uh, I'm this is not about elitism here it's just simply saying that some things are probably art and some things just probably aren't so right yeah yeah and so that what, what's the date of that again Mark uh, Saturday the 19th is when the actual broadcast will be and last year we kind of did a takeover for the Sunday morning service as well okay. and uh, I think we're going to do that as well this year so yeah, so what a great idea uh, for, like, what a great idea for churches to do, I think, you and it can be done, uh, a kind of thing could be done in all different kinds of scales, really. It's Absolutely, not just, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, if anybody, if anybody has, uh, if anybody's kind of, you spark their interest with that, uh, they can, they can contact you and get some pointers on maybe how to do that in their area, but uh, sure. yeah, that, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to be a part of that and seeing seeing how all that turns out and uh that might be a good place for us to end today so for sure thanks uh thanks for taking the time to to talk today my and, pleasure uh, all right